Through our discussion of the silicate minerals, we're on to the sorosilicates. The sorosilicates take up a very small portion of the textbook, only pages 498 to 500. And the reason why is because there's very few of them. Actually, only about 70 minerals are known that are the sorosilicates. And for our class, we're only going to talk about one. As a family, the shared properties of the sorosilicates, right, this rare group with only 70 minerals, they are the sorority sisters, right, where there's the 2SiO4, 4 minus tetrahedra that share one oxygen, that share one bridging oxygen. As we visualize what that structure looks like, we can make it look like a bow tie where the two silica tetrahedra are touching and they are sharing just that one bridging oxygen. All right, that's what you need to visualize. Now for the mineral, this is what you're gonna visualize because the mineral is epidote. So we'll throw in this picture here as we start to talk about the epidote group of minerals. Epidote. And we're actually going to call this a group because there's three minerals here that are all similar to one another that kind of all have the same chemical formula. What we're going to do is we're going to put the chemical formula here. What I want you to learn is that epidote and minerals in the epidote group have a formula that's called a complex calcium aluminum iron. And the silica part, well, what's the silica part of this unit? It was Si207, and that's what this is here, Si207. So that's the formula that you're going to memorize for the epidote group. And it's this right here that can occur with a different solid solution that allows the different end members. All right, so we have this different solid solution. And the two end members I want you to know is epidote. And it is by far the most common because iron is very common in the Earth's crust. And so whenever there is iron in this chemical formula, the mineral is called epidote. When there is a lack of iron, which is more rare but certainly possible, it's called clinozoocyte or just zoocyte. They have the same chemical formula. One is monoclinic and the other is orthorhombic, but that's beyond the purposes of this class. So what I'd like to do now is talk about the mineralogy of epidote proper. And so we'll go here, we'll go uh, mineralogy. And maybe the first thing to notice about epidote shown in these two pictures up here is that the color is fairly pronounced. And in this class, epidote is always going to be pistachio green. Now, in reality, in nature, it can be anywhere from shades of yellow to black, but I'm not going to show you one that's that color because most of the time, let's say 9 times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100, epidote that you're going to see is going to be this pistachio green color. Oh, we left out the hardness. Hardness, this is like a 6.5, and the specific gravity, G, is around a 3.3 for this group. The crystals themselves can take the, either of these two forms, where you're going to see these kind of striated prisms. Sometimes they're even radiating or splayed, where they kind of all come off of a center point. You can sort of see that behavior right in here. Or they may be very massive, granular crystal habit. In fact, this sample shows the, the prisms here growing off of a substrate into a hydrothermal vein and the massive together. So let's summarize that here. We're going to have um, monoclinic prisms. And sometimes we're going to use the word radiating splays of these crystals, or we'll see that at least. And then in other samples, it's just going to be massive. It's a pretty common mineral. So for our geology, this is one that you're definitely going to see in your geologic adventures because it is a rock forming mineral in metamorphic rocks. Rock forming mineral in, well, and there's a specific type of metamorphic rocks that these occur in. We're going to call them low grade. And specifically, for those who have been trained somewhat in petrology, this would be like the green schist facies. 
and the type of metamorphic rocks, they tend to be mafic. So we're going to say metamorphics. And underneath metamorphics, we're going to be a little more specific, specific about the composition of the metamorphics. And we're going to say mafic. Mafic rocks are going to be able to provide that calcium and iron in particular that's going to allow epidote to form in those metamorphic rocks. Now, one reason why even that low grade is called green schist is because of the green color in our epidote. And then the other ver geo geologic occurrence is hydrothermal systems. And in this case, we've got a quartz vein that was growing in, from a hydrothermal fluid, and epidote is growing into that same vein. So we can see an example of that here. So our second example of our geology of epidote is in hydrothermal veins and associated alteration. And that's really it for the sorosilicates beyond one little addition. We could put this as C, or you could say, you could have a little star and say a side. There is a gem stone that is growing in popularity. It was only discovered in 1967, and, and it's a gemstone called Tanzanite. And what tanzanite is, it's actually gem quality zoocyte. But when the discoverers in Africa, in Tanzania, in 1967, saw this beautiful gem quality zoocyte, marketing it was a disaster because zoocyte, in English, sounds like suicide. And so it's kind of an ugly word. And so they changed the name to be called tanzanite, to be more exotic and elegant. What tanzanite looks like, so here's a good picture showing tanzanite and zoocyte. So the zoocyte crystal in nature is kind of this brown orthorhombic um, epidote mineral. But the tanzanite variety has this very strong and beautiful blue to purple color. So what we'll put here just as a, a kind of a quick note is that this is a blue purple and it is growing in its demand, mostly as a sapphire replacement, because sapphire is more expensive, and people find that they can get the same kind of stunning beauty from zoocyte, from tanzanite. But the problem is, sapphire is a 9, right? And zoocyte's only a 6.5 in the hardness scale, so it doesn't wear as well. It's much easier to chip and um, cause problems. Now, the one last kind of interesting mineralogical aspect of tanzanite is that when it comes out of the ground, it is this brown color, right? Like we see here, this brown color. And it requires heating. When you heat it, it will change to this beautiful bluish color. And so that's the last thing I want you to say here is that, so it is brown naturally and shifts to purple blue, and, and it's purple or blue when heated. Ends up being that about 95% of all tanzanite that you see on the market has been heated by man. Although, although there are really rare instances where nature from like forest fires and lightning or lava flows has actually heated the brown tanzanite in a natural way to make blue.